My, my view is very different. I, I believe we're living in the greatest times of the church. There is nothing God is gonna do in you and through you that he can't start doing today. The question is not what do I want to do with my life, but Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Sage, what is it you see that's going on in the world now? Well, I have probably a little bit different view mm -hmm. than, than many people. You know, when I watch the news, especially here in the States, it's all bad yeah. and it's very negative. My, my view is very different. I, I believe we're living in the greatest times of the church. Amen. More people are coming to Christ today than at any other time in church history. We have seen just our little ministry in Africa, we've seen 78 million people come to Christ mm -hmm. since 1987. It's, it's ridiculous. It's unheard of. Million. That's, that's, that's million. over 7,000 people a day yeah. for 30 consecutive years. Wow. That's just one little ministry. We're by no means the biggest or the only thing that God is doing. In China, people are coming to Christ by the millions, tens of thousands every single day. We're seeing it in Pakistan, in India, in Europe. I mean, I was just in, in the Ukraine with some of my friends there, and uh, they were saying that this is the most uh, atheistic place in Europe. They said, nobody's going to gather here. We saw 15,000, mostly young people, gather in the stadium. Thousands of them gave their hearts to the Lord. This is all over the world. God is moving. And yes, there are bad things, but when sure. sin abounds, grace abounds even more. That's right. So I would just encourage believers not to get down in the dumps, not to adopt that stinking mindset of the right. enemy that, you know, just hold on by the skin of our teeth until we get raptured out of here. Man, let's take the world for Jesus. We have yeah. the greatest opportunity to do that of anyone that's ever lived. I want you to consider for just a moment the significance of Jesus sending his disciples to the upper room after he ascended before sending them out to the nations. I want you to think about this for a moment. This is something that all of you know very well, but don't let its familiarity steal from you its significance. These men had been with Jesus for over three years. They'd heard all of his sermons firsthand. They didn't read about them in a book. They wrote the book that you read about them in. They saw his miracles with their own eyes. They knew all of his parables by heart. They were the most educated Christians that had ever lived, if I can say it that way. If they were alive today, I think they would receive honorary PhDs from every Christian university. Brother Arnott, you think the school here would give the Apostle Peter an honorary doctorate? Yes, I think so. They would receive honorary ministerial credentials from every denomination, even the non-charismatic ones. I think they let Paul in, even though he speaks in tongues, more than any of them. They were the most qualified Christians that had ever lived, and yet Jesus looked at these men, the most qualified of all, and this is what he said to them, you're not ready yet. You're missing something. You see, Jesus knew that if he sent them out at that moment the way that they were, they would only be able to give to others what they had received themselves. And they would be able to give sermons. They could give the best sermons. They learned from Jesus. He was their mentor. He, they could tell stories. They could use parables. But he knew that none of those things would change the world. And he knew that they would only be able to give what they had themselves received. And that's why he said, go to Jerusalem and wait until you receive the promise of the Father. Because when the Holy Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power in Jesus' name. What is the secret to an open heaven? I often share about a guy named Daniel Nash, who was an intercessor for Charles Finney. Now, many people know the, the great ministry of Charles Finney. What they don't realize is that before Finney would go into a town, he would send his intercessor, a man by the name of Daniel Nash, to go and to break open that spiritual atmosphere. And once that work had been accomplished in the spirit through prayer, then Finney would come in and have those mighty revivals and cities and, and the nation was shaken by it. And the key is intercession. I believe that in these last days, God is going to bring together a marriage of the evangelists, the soul winners, and the intercessors, the prayer warriors. They're gonna join together and I believe we're gonna see the greatest harvest of souls in the history of the world. Now I'm going to ask a very important question. How many of you would say tonight, evangelists, I need to surrender my life to Jesus? Maybe you've never done it before. 
Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Tonight is your night. And if you would say, tonight I'm ready to surrender everything to Jesus. Then I want to pray with you. If that's your prayer, let me see your hands all over this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to lead you now in a prayer of surrender. I don't want you to whisper this prayer. I want you to cry out with all of your heart. Are you ready? Are you ready? Pray first in English after me and then after my interpreter. Say, dear Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you the one. Come on, shout it out. Dear Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, you the one. I come to you tonight. A sinner. And listen. Needing salvation. Not making a choice is making a choice in itself. And this is the thing, so many people sitting there on the fence, young people, they haven't made that choice to sow it for Jesus yet. And they think, well, I'll make that choice one day. No, you made it already. Because one day never comes. I remember sitting in meetings like this and hearing preachers talk about their experiences with God. I remember thinking to myself, one day I'm gonna serve Jesus like that. I remember them hearing, hearing them tell stories about miracles, about pulling people out of wheelchairs, about laying their hands on blind people. And, and I thought, one day I'm gonna do that. And this happened for years. And then one day I realized, I've been saying one day for years. If I keep saying one day, 10 years from now is gonna be just like today, and 20 years from now is just gonna be like 10 years from now, and my whole life is gonna be just one day. I realized it's gotta start now. There is nothing God is gonna do in you and through you that he can't start doing today. I, when I was preaching in a church. A revival had broken out. A lot of people were getting saved. I'll tell us real short. And um, I, I heard one of the new converts talking to an elder. And the new convert was asking the elder, you know, what's the key to prayer? He was saying, I hear people saying that they pray for hours a day. And he said, you know, I pray for five minutes and then I don't know what to talk about. So the elder started giving him advice. I heard him, I overheard this conversation. The elder said, first what you need to do is make a list of all your friends. Then make a list of your family members. Make a list of all the things going on in the world, all the current events. Make a list of the things you're thankful for. Make a list of all your needs. And he said, once you've made all these lists, then he said, then you'll have enough um, fodder there so that you can pray for a long, long time. And um, I, I thought to myself, the guy, that the elder doesn't pray very much. <laughs> that was my opinion. So when, I, when they had walked away from each other, I grabbed that young guy and I pulled him close and I said, can I give you my advice on, on how, to, how to pray? And he said, yeah, please. I said, just be quiet. Just listen. When, when you're in a conversation with somebody, especially somebody that is much wiser than you and has much more profound things to say, your best bet is just to be quiet and to listen to what they have to say. And if you learn to do that, if you learn to listen, you'll find prayer becomes life-giving. You'll find that there is an outpouring of divine life into you rather than you just trying to perform and rack your brain and talk a lot. So for me, that's, that's how I practice um, the presence of the Lord, that's the key for me, is stilling my, my own spirit, my own soul, and training my ears to listen to that, the voice of the Good Shepherd. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You know, there are healing evangelists. I know a lot of healing evangelists, people that have built their ministries on healing and it's amazing. And some of them would be very upset about what I'm telling you or what, maybe what I'm about to tell you, okay? Because <laughs> I'm gonna give you some insider information. Some, some industry secrets, okay? <clears throat> this is the truth. Again, I, maybe I'm contradicting something that you've heard. I don't know. I'm just telling you from my experience. There is nothing that I have or that Ryan Harbonke has 
or that Benny Hinn has or that Andrew Womack has or you name, you name the person who sees great miracles. There's nothing that any of us have that you don't have access to right now through the blood of Jesus. I could show you the very spot on the carpet where I made that decision. Today I have seen the dead raised. I have seen amazing miracles. I've seen millions of people come to Christ. I've lived a dream, but it all began with one decision to say yes to Jesus and not to make any excuses. Maybe you say, well, evangelist, I'm young. My friend, being young does not mean that you can't follow Jesus. You may not be able to go get on an airplane and go to another country right now as a missionary, but I tell you what you can do. You can tell your parents about Jesus. You can tell your friends about Jesus. You can win your schoolmates to Jesus. People say, where did you get your start in evangelism? They, I think they think that I, I, my start began on the mission field. You know what I used to do? I used to go through my neighborhood knocking on the door, on the doors in my neighborhood. And when people would answer the door, I was a little boy. I would say to them, let me ask you a question. If you were to die today and you stood before the Lord and he said, why should I let you into heaven? What would be your answer? And mostly they just chuckled and patted me on the head. Cute little boy. But I was serious. And as I got older, it became more serious. You know, I was preaching with a friend of mine who has a long criminal history. He's been arrested many times and in jail and extradited and all kinds of stuff. And after he got finished sharing his testimony, I got up and I told the people, much to their surprise, that I had also been led away by the police on many occasions, not for doing drugs or something, but for preaching the gospel. I've stood up in movie theaters and on park benches and on rest tables in restaurants to preach the gospel. My friend, you can start right where you are today. You can do something for Jesus. Maybe it's small, maybe it seems insignificant to you, but that little bit of faithfulness he will use if you don't say but first say yes Leonard Ravenhill once asked this question is what you're living for worth Christ dying for my friend we were not saved so that we could be polished decorative knickknacks sitting on God's shelf filling space in heaven for eternity we have been saved for a purpose in this world and our response to that call our wholehearted giving of ourselves is the only acceptable reaction that we could have to the mercy we've been shown by God. My friend, in light of these things, what should we do? Maybe you feel a desire to respond by offering your life as a rocket booster to propel God's kingdom forward, but you're not sure where to begin. When Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, met the Lord on the road to Damascus, this is what Paul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And this is where our journey begins. The simple question. The question is not what do I want to do with my life, but Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Wow, I love Daniel. He's amazing. He's amazing. Thank you for your audience. And let's go to the last key. Bye. Saturday morning, I came to Accra to visit my own brothers. So after visiting them, I was coming back to go Tema. It was very late and the train left. So I just went and slept at this place. Be healed right now in the name of Jesus. Blind eyes open, open in the name of Jesus. Deaf ears open in the name of Jesus. I wake up and I heard my, he, my ear sound and I was healed, that Im immediately I was healed. I went to the people and said, no, let me testify this, I, I, I was deaf. I, I, my name is Mohammed. I, I have a problem for my ears for almost two years. I, when you speak, I don't understand. I can't hear very well. So I have this problem for two years. So I'm, I'm not even trying to come here. I came from Tema. I came to Kanesin. By going to take a train, I make late. So I say, let me come to the Independence Square. You see, I came to Independence Square. I was sitting down here, just here. I did not even. Pray. I did not do anything. So, I, 
I wake up and I, I, I can hear, and the ears was telling me I can hear. People who know me can testify that I am very happy. I think Jesus is is a is a Jesus is 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 a God. He understands me. I was not born to be dead. I was not born to worship a God that I did not know. I'm telling you, I am standing here. I can hear. I can be able to speak again. I will walk again for my work, and then I will feel very, very nice. I thank God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God. You know who has healed you? It's, it's, it's messenger of the Lord Almighty God. Je What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. And, and then I know that even the Quran tell me that if you are a Muslim and you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you are not a movement. You are not Muslim. So I, I believe that it's like that. Yeah. I thank all. I thank God to. I can hear. I, I can feel it. I. My ears is good. I thank God. I thank the Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, my friends. Nobody else opens the ears of the deaf. Only Jesus. He, he is not just a messenger. He is the Son of the living God. Yes, He is the way and the truth and the life. Say amen. Yeah, yes. I present anybody who know me and see my face. My name is Mohammed, and I came from Gambaga. Let me tell my wife that Jesus is the Son of God. And let me tell him.